We present Rope, a radio version of Patrick Hamilton's famous thriller set in the late 1920s. It stars Alan Rickman as Rupert Cadell and Adam Barham as Wyndham Brandon, with Andrew Branch as Charles Grinillo, Cyril Luckham as Sir Johnston Kentley, and Moya Leslie as Leela Arden. Rope by Patrick Hamilton. All right. All right. I'll lock it. Put the key in my pocket and turn on the light. Put out that light! Put out that light! I need steady, Grano. Feeling yourself, Grano. Feeling yourself again, Grano. Give me some matches. Matches? Here you are. Coming. Oh. Isn't it about time you pulled yourself together, Grano? Sabo will be here in a quarter of an hour. You, 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 you fully understand, Brandon, what we've done. Do I know what I've done? Yes, I know quite well what I've done. I have done murder. Yes. I have committed murder. I have committed passionless, motiveless, faultless and clueless murder. Bloodless and noiseless murder. Yes. An immaculate murder. I have killed. I have killed for the sake of danger and for the sake of killing. And I am alive. Truly and wonderfully alive. That's what I've done, Grano. What's the matter? You're getting superstitious. No. No, I'm, I'm not superstitious. Then may I put on the light? No. No, you mayn't. Brandon. Yes? You remember when, when Ronald came in? What do you mean, when Ronald came in? When Ronald came in here, when he came in from the car, you were standing at the door. Yes. Did you see anyone standing there? Up the street, uh, about 70 yards? No. But there was someone, there was a man. I, I saw him, I remembered. Well, what of it? <sighs> Nothing. <sighs> Brandon. Yes? When I met Ronald, when I met him, Coming out of the Colosseum, when I met him and got him into the car, ready to bring him here. Oh, why shouldn't someone have seen us then? What do you mean by someone? Oh, someone, anyone. Did we think of that, Brandon? I did. It's in the room, you know. Do you think we'll get away with it? When, tonight? Yes. Are you suggesting that some psychic force emanating from this chest is going to advise Sir Johnston Kentley of the fact that the remains... Or shall I say, the lifeless entirety of his 20-year-old son and heir is contained therein. My dear Granillo, if you're feeling in any way insecure, perhaps I'd better fortify you with a brief summary of facts. With mathematics, as it were. Let me please... Listen! Give you a... What? Listen, I tell you! <sighs> it's all right. I thought it was Sabo. Sabo, in the first place, will not be here until five minutes to nine, if then, for Sabo is seldom punctual. Sabo, in the second place, has been deprived by a wily master of his key. He will therefore ring. <laughs> Let me, I say, give you a cool narration of our transactions. This afternoon, at about two o'clock, young Ronald Kentley, our fellow undergraduate, left his father's house with the object of visiting the Colosseum Music Hall. He did so. After the performance, he was met in the street by your good self and invited to this house. Mm -hmm. He was then given tea. And at 6.45 precisely, done to death by strangulation and rope. <sighs> he was subsequently deposited in this chest. Tonight, at nine o'clock, his father, Sir Johnston Kentley, and three well-chosen friends of ours will come round here for 
for regalement. They will talk small talk and depart. After the party, this party at 11 o'clock... It isn't a slip, is it, Brandon? Oh, my dear Grano, have we not already agreed that the entire beauty and piquancy of the evening will reside in the party itself? Now, at 11 o'clock tonight, I was saying, you and I will leave by car for Oxford. We will carry our fellow undergraduate. Our fellow undergraduate will never be heard of again. Our fellow undergraduate will not be murdered. He will be missing. That is the complete story and the perfection of criminality. The complete story of the perfect crime. I'm quite lucid, am I not? Yes. The party itself, Grano, you see, so far from being our vulnerable point, is the very apex, as it were, and consummation of our feet. Consider its ingredients. I still don't think we could have chosen better. There will be first, and by all means foremost, Sir Johnston Kentley, the father of... the occupant of the chest. It is he, as the father, who gives the entire macabre quality of the evening. Well chosen so far. We then, of course, require his wife, but she, being an invalid, was unobtainable, alas. <laughs> Hello? Hello? What? What? Put out that light! Put out that light, I tell you! Steady, Grano! Hello, hello! Will you put down that receiver, uh, Grano? You're telling London you're afraid! Uh, Come over here and sit down. Yes. Well, go on. There are then Kenneth Raglan and Leela Arden. They have been asked for their youth, innocence and good spirits alone. Also in Raglan, who went to the same school and is at the same university as ourselves, you have about the most perfect specimen of ordinary humanity obtainable. And therefore, a suitable witness to this so extraordinary scene. So, unintellectual humanity is represented. The same applies to Leela, his female counterpart. <laughs> we then come to Rupert. Now, in Rupert, Grano, we have a very intriguing proposition. Rupert, in fact, is about the one man alive who might have seen this thing from our angle. That is, the artistic one. You will recall that we even contemplated at one time inviting him to share our dangers. Mm. And we eventually turned the notion down, not necessarily because it would have been too much for him to swallow intellectually, but simply because he would not have had the nerve. Rupert is a damnably brilliant poet, but perhaps a little too fastidious. So, he is in the same blissless ignorance as the rest. Nevertheless, he is intellect's representative and valued at that. Grano? Grano? Uh, uh, yes? What's the time? Oh, uh, I, uh, Oh, n n nearly five to nine. Sabo will be here at any moment now. I know. May I put on the lights? Oh, must you? Yes, I must. Can't you go on talking? No, I can't, I'm afraid. Go on. I'm all right. Put it on. I, I, I'm better now. Thank you. I thought you were going to lose your nerve for a moment, Grant. Oh, so did I. But I wasn't. God, you fool! Didn't I tell you to check up in here? What? On the floor. Look at this. The boy's coliseum. Oh. We can hang on that. Oh, what in heaven's name? Give it to me. It must have fallen out of my waistcoat pocket. I, I, I put it here. Damnation, that sabo. Now, for God's sake, quiet yourself and sit down. Read the paper or play the piano or something. Good idea. The piano. Play yes. something soothing. I'll let sabo in. Yes. Sorry for my little outburst, Grano, but it rather upset me. Not at all. You were right. What's the time? Uh, it's just after five two. Then we can expect our first guest. <laughs> yes. I, I must go and let Sam. Good evening, Sam. Good evening.
drinks, sir. Shall we have a little drink? Never mind, supper. The food's already in the kitchen. As the dining room's all covered with books, will you lay the supper on the chest in the sitting room? Uh, but I can bring the table from upstairs, sir. Oh, no, that's all right, Sabo. Lay it on the chest. Uh, no, sir, it will be no trouble to bring from upstairs. Uh, nevertheless, Sabo, lay it on the chest, will you? Very good, sir. In here? In here. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Sabo. That's it. Um, plates and things on the side, please. And food on the chest, lovely. Yes, sir. Yes, perfect. <laughs> ah, here we are. He's early, whoever it is. Uh, to bring in here, sir? Yes, in here. Very good, sir. Don't stop playing, Grandpa. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, please, sir. I'm not late, I'm not late. Uh, Mr. Hangland, sir. Hello, hello, Raglan, old man. Come right in. You know Grinello, don't you? Rather. <laughs> Quite a long time since we met, though. Uh, yes, isn't it? <laughs> oh. I, I, I say, I, I'm terribly sorry. I've come dressed. My dear fellow, my fault entire. <laughs> come and seat yourself. Uh, I should have explained. You see, we're going up to Oxford tonight. Oh, uh, no. Are you? I'm not going up till Friday. Ah. Now, what are you going to drink? Uh, you can have uh, gin and Italian, mm -hmm. or gin and Angostura, and I can do you a very nice gin and French. I should like gin and it, I think. Gin and it, right. <laughs> yes, uh, we leave tonight about 12 and travel by automobile in the, let us hope, moonlight. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this place is simply covered with books. Covered with books? Uh, yes, in the next room. Uh, I've come into a library. Here's your gin and it. Oh, thanks. Come into a library? Uh, yes. Did you ever hear of old Jerry Wickham, Kenneth? An uncle of mine. Oh, yes, rather. Well, you know that he's died just lately. Oh, has he? Mm. Uh, yes. Well, it's his library, uh, which is very kindly and unexpectedly bestowed upon me. Good Lord. To the unspeakable mortification of Sir Johnston Kentley. Oh, Sir Johnston Kentley. He's quite a famous collector, isn't he? Yes, he's coming here tonight. Good heavens, is he? It is the same man, isn't it? He lives in Grosvenor Square and has a son. Quite right, Kenneth. He lives in Grosvenor Square and has a son. <laughs> Have you got a drink, Grano? Uh, uh, oh, yes. Well, drink up, Kenneth. <laughs> Cheerho. Mm. Tell me, Sir Johnston's son, isn't that Ronald Kentley, the lad who's so frightfully good at sports? That's right. You don't know him, do you? No. I've never met him, but he wins hurdles and hundreds of yards and things like that, doesn't he? <laughs> yes, that's right. As a matter of fact, he's the living image of yourself, isn't he, Grano? Uh, yes. Yes, he is like me. In what way? Oh, in every way. Same age, same height, same colour, same sweet and refreshing innocence. Oh, <laughs> shut up. I'm not an athlete anyway. No, but you're just as much alive. In fact, more so. Am I? <laughs> then you're having Sir Johnston here just sort of to make him grind his teeth with envy about the books, then? Oh, on the contrary. I'm going to let him have exactly what he wants, provided I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you all this, Kenneth, just to excuse the terrible mess we're in. You'll observe that we're having our meal off a chest. Oh, yes. I thought it looked rather weird. Good Lord, Kenneth. You're getting positively fat. Am I? Nothing like the little boy who used to fag for me at school. Lord, that's a while ago. Oh, it doesn't seem so very long. Uh, of course, uh, I used to think you an absolute hero in those days, Brandon. <laughs> Did you? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I was always more or less popular amongst the juniors. It was I who was the unpopular one. Were you unpopular, Grano? Oh, yes, I... I remember I used to loathe you in those days. There you are. Why did you loathe him? Oh, I don't know. I suppose games were the only things that ever counted in those days. I'm sure it was most unreasonable. It was, I assure you. <laughs> I'm very harmless. Here we are. I wonder if that's Rupert. Uh, did you ever meet Rupert, Kenneth, Rupert Cadell? No, I, I can't say that I have. Uh, no, he was before your time, wasn't he? Hmm. Aha, 
the ravishing Leela. <laughs> Come along, my dear, this way. How are you? You know Grano, don't you? <laughs> Hello. How do you do? And this is Kenneth. Uh, Mr. Raglan, Miss Arden. Hello. Hello. Now, what are you going to have, Leela? Kenneth's having a gin and it. I'd adore one. Gin and it? It shall be. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I simply know that I've seen you somewhere before. Really? You're not a friend and on sea expert, are you? <laughs> no, uh, I just go there occasionally, that's all. <laughs> How weird, because I could simply swear that I've seen you somewhere before. <laughs> How weird. <laughs> Previous incarnation, I expect. Here you are, Leela. Thank you. Excuse, mess. We're in a horrible mess here altogether. Uh, Kenneth will tell you about it. I've come into a library. Come into a library, my dear? Yes. And I hope you don't think you're going to get anything to eat, because all the servants are away and we're very humble. No, you <laughs> told me that, and I had a simply gluttonous high tea. Gorged, my dear. Oh, well, that's all right. I, I really wouldn't have asked you, only this is the last chance of seeing you before we go up. Are you going up tonight, then? Yes, of, of course. I'm feeling absolutely ghastly coming dressed like this. Why? Well, I'm sure I ought to be dressed, too. Of course, you must admit, my dear, this is a most mysterious and weird meal. Why? Um, mysterious and, and weird? Oh, I don't know, Grano. Just mysterious and weird. Such a queer time to begin with. Oh, here we are. I'll bet you that's old Kentley. Forgive me a moment, I must go and usher him in. Who's the newcomer? Uh, the, the newcomer, Leela, is, is the revered Sir Johnston Kentley, who has come here to, to look at books. My well, dear. Uh, unless it's Rupert, which of course it may be. Oh, no. No, it, it's Sir Johnston, all right. Which, of course, can never be done. <laughs> ah, how do you do, Janillo? Uh, and how are you getting on? Oh, very well, thank you, sir. Hello. Now, let me introduce you yes. all. Uh, Miss Arden, Sir Johnston Kentley. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, and this is Mr. Kenneth Raglan. How, how do you do, yeah. sir? How do you do? And here, Sir Johnston, is an armchair, <laughs> which I think is more or less in your line. Uh, and here is a chest from which we're going to feed, the table having been commandeered for books. Oh, that, that chest. It's not a cassone, is it? Uh, no, sir, it's not genuine. It's a reproduction. But it's a rather nice piece I got in Italy. Now, will you have a cocktail, sir? Oh, good heavens, no, my boy. Now, uh, these books I'm going to see, uh, where are they? Uh, oh, they're in the other room, the dining room. Uh, I laid them out as well as I could, and there's more space in there. Oh, I shall be most interested to see them, most interested. I seem to remember that Wickham had a really remarkable little lot of Shakespeareana. Yes. Ah! That will be Rupert. Oh. I'm afraid, sir, the folios were sold before Wickham died. Oh. But there's a run of the quartos and a really amazing lot of Baconian stuff. <sighs> At least I'm told it's very fine. Oh. Uh, uh, Mr. Cadell, sir. Ah, here he is, here he is. Last as usual. Come along in, Rupert. Uh, Mr. Cadell, Miss Leela Arden. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Mr. Cadell, Sir Johnston Kentley. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, Mr. Raglan, Mr. Cadell. How do you do? But tell me, I don't quite follow. Have I come dressed, or have others come undressed? I telephoned an inquiry, but could not obtain, um, any answer. Now contain yourself, Rupert, and sit down. What in heaven is this? This is a chest, Rupert, and we're going to have our meal off it. Oh, are we? Yes. Why are we going to have our meal off a chest? Because it's a very nice chest, and because... All the tables are covered with books. Yes, haven't you heard? The entire place is covered with library. No. Now, Rupert, are you going to have a cocktail? No, no thank you. I've had four already. Four? four? Yes, why? Aren't I carrying my drink? Oh, yes, you're carrying it all right. It's just rather a mean advantage, that's all. <laughs> that's all right, Sabo. I'll ring when we're through. Then you can clear and get away. Thank you, sir. When do we begin to have our meal off a chest? Because I'm personally rather peckish. We're starting right away, Rupert. Now, look here, you people. There are lots of plates and knives and things on the sideboard and lots of sandwiches and things on the chest. Pate, caviar, salmon and cucumber, whatnot. Oh, all you've got to do is to rally round and help yourselves. <laughs> that's, that's marvellous. Come on, then. Oh, look at this. I adore caviar, don't you? Yes, rather. Well, wait a minute and I'll get you some. Uh, what will you have, sir? Yes, uh, do you oh, want a sandwich? Thank you so much. 
Um, uh, you, the great Cadell? The great oh, Cadell, sir. So why? Do you know anything about me? Well, I've read your poems, that's all. Mm. Or at, at least uh, a lot of them. Oh, dear me, I hope you're not confusing me with the other Cadell, sir. No, I don't think so. You write poems, don't you? I am told so, sir, but then so does the other Cadell, a devastating creature who spells it with two Ds. Oh, oh no, there's no confusion. I never knew you could spell Cadell with two Ds. Same here. Yes, same here. I knew a Cadell once, and she used to spell it with only one D, Louisa Cadell. Horrible old hag she was, too. She lived in Bayswater. <laughs> Dear heaven, the young man is alluding to my aunt. Uh, oh, I say, I... I, I'm terribly sorry. Have I dropped a brick? No, you've said a mouthful. <laughs> Can I have another sandwich? <laughs> I say, must we have our meal off a chest? Is Lady Kentley any better, sir? Um, no, I'm afraid not. I'm, I'm afraid she's still in bed. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, and how's Ronald getting on? No, oh, Ronald. Oh, he's getting on all right. He's... Uh, Merely idling, of course, now, like you two. Does he like it, or, or does he want to get back? Oh, no, he doesn't want to get back. He has a great time. Who's Ronald? Ronald, he's my son and heir. Twenty years of age. Oh, I know Ronald. He was in the papers the other day for winning the high jump at the Varsity Sports. Oh, that's right. Yes, I remember it well. There was a picture of me next door to it. Oh, what's that? Yes. Not, though, for winning the high jump. Oh, yes, quite an old friend. Yes, he's a sprightly lad, is Ronald. <laughs> Brandon says he's like me. Is that true, sir? Well, uh, uh, yes, he, he is rather like you when you come to think of it. Uh, quite like, really. I've a double, apparently. My dear, how excruciating. <laughs> in, in what way is he like me, sir? Well, I don't know, just in general usefulness. And innocence <laughs> and freshness <laughs> and gaiety. Shut up, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> He's so afraid they won't think him a man, isn't he? <laughs> no, that's like Ronald, too. I'm afraid they won't feel like that for long, though. No, they won't, poor dears. No, of course. My boy's the most infantile thing in the world. I honestly believe his only passion in holiday time is the movies. When I saw him at lunch, he was just rushing off to the Coliseum. Yeah, but that's not the movies, is it? Hmm? I thought it was a music hall. Not that oh. I know. I've never been there in my life. Never <laughs> been to the Coliseum? Why should he have been to the Coliseum? Uh, I thought everybody had been. Well, I haven't. Uh, neither have I. Is that the place in the Haymarket? My dear Grano, you're mixing it up with the capital. What abysmal ignorance. <laughs> You'd have been as sad dog as an ancient Roman, Granillo. <laughs> yes, he would. Indeed, in the days of the Caesars, the results of confusing the Colosseum with the Capitol would have been, I should imagine, almost fatal. <laughs> but turn to the 20th century for just one moment. Do you mean to tell me, Granillo, that you have never been to the Colosseum? No. No, of course I haven't. Uh, never. Why? You mean you can... You can stand there and puff out your chest and tell me that you had never been to the Colosseum. Yes. Why? Why should you think that I had? Merely the hawk-like sharpness of my vision. <laughs> Why? Is it a crime never to have been to the Colosseum? No, sir. I don't expect it's a crime. For in that case, I'm afraid I myself am guilty. But young Ronald <laughs> has been to the Coliseum anyway, sir. Yeah, that's right. I simply must have one more of these delicious sandwiches. Let me. <laughs> you know, oh. Oh, I'm, I'm so coming so to the conclusion that there's some ulterior motive about this chest picnic. What do you mean, ulterior motive? Ah, you mean it's done purely to make you spill things on your trousers, Rupert. I think it's more than likely. Oh, I suspect much worse than that. I think they've committed murder. <laughs> and the chest is simply chock full of rotting bones. Mm. It's just the sort of thing for rotting bones, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> My dear, you're right. I wouldn't let you see the inside of that chest for worlds. I'm sure you wouldn't. Uh, 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 try, try one of these sandwiches, Leela. Oh, thank you. Mm, it's all, all very well to try and bluff me out and pretend you're willing to let me see it. But, my dear, that's just what I said I wouldn't do. I have my suspicions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but surely your murderer, having chopped up and concealed his victim in a chest... Why, I wouldn't ask all his friends round to come and eat off it? Not <laughs> unless he was a very stupid 
And very conceited murderer. No, <laughs> very stupid and very conceited. But of course he might be. In fact, it's exactly what all criminals are. Oh, no, I don't think so. Well, anyway, who says Books. Oh, that's a very good idea. I have a gramophone for the very young, if they care to make use of it. But I thought you said the next room was covered with books. Oh, no, there's room to dance. This way, Sir Johnston. Oh, thank you. Come along the rest of you when you want to, that is. I have dozens of records in there. You coming, Leela? Oh, rather. You dance, sir. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, Rupert... Well, my dear Grano, you look rather fagged out. Oh, uh, do I? I? I don't feel it. What have you been doing with yourself? Doing with myself? Oh, nothing. Why do you ask? For no reason whatever. You seem rather touchy. Ah, yes, yes, I, I'm a bit liverish. I, I've been sleeping most of the afternoon and that always puts me out for the rest of the day. Ah, that's what I do. Uh, you, 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 uh, writing anything lately? Yes. A little thing about doves. Mm -hmm. And a little thing about rain. Both good. Very good, in fact. And then, of course, I'm getting ahead with the big work. Oh, that going well? Yes, very. Indeed, it promises to be not only the best thing I've ever written, but the best thing I have ever read. <laughs> that tune. It's rather nice, isn't it? Mm. So, you and Brandon leave tonight for Oxford. That's right. What time are you going? Uh, we're aiming to start about 10.30. Arriving there about when? Oh, about three? Why? Peculiar form of enjoyment, Grano. But then that's like you. <laughs> Why? Lovely moonlight night. It's not. It's raining already. It's not. Yes, it is. Listen. Oh. oh yes. yes. It is coming down, isn't it? Uh, excuse me, Grano. Reaching across oh, you yes. as a book on the mantelpiece. Mm -hmm. uh, got it. Thank you. Oh. Uh, Joseph Conrad. Dear me. Grano! Dear me. Grano, you're welcome. Oh, uh, coming. You, you, you coming along too, Rupert? <laughs> no, I'm all right. With this book from the mantelpiece and this Coliseum ticket from your waistcoat pocket. Hmm. Stalls for the 17th. Come in. Oh, excuse me, sir. May I clear the chest, sir? Um, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. How are you getting on? Very well, thank you, sir. It's going to be a dirty night. Yes, sir. It is a set in now, sir. I suppose... Mr. Brandon will still be going, though. Pardon, sir? I suppose Mr. Brandon will still be going, though, to Oxford. Oh, yes, sir, I, I suppose so, sir. Have you any idea of the date, sir? The date, sir? Yes, sir, it is the, the, the 16th, sir. The... The, no, no, sir, no, sir, I, it is not, sir. It is the 17th, sir. Yes, I thought so. The 17th. Stalls for the 17th. Have you been getting into trouble lately, Sabo? Trouble, sir? Yes, trouble. I was wondering whether you had been getting into any trouble with your employers. Me, sir? No, sir. What should make you think so, sir? Well, I telephoned this house at a quarter to nine and heard the most hysterical noises. Hysterical noises, hysterical, sir? Hysterical, Sabo, noises. Somebody had evidently lost their nerve. I was wondering whether you were the cause of it. Me, sir? Oh, no, sir. Not me, sir. Uh, I was not here till five to nine. Then are you the one that frequents the Colosseum, Sabo? Yes, sir. I said, are you the one that frequents the Colosseum? Oh, sir. I, I did not hear, sir. Uh, pardon, sir. The Colosseum, sir? No, sir. You don't? The music hall, sir? Yes. No, sir, no, sir. I, well, I have been there once, sir, many years ago. But not lately? No, sir. Strange. 
Well, someone in this house frequents the Colosseum, Sabo, and Mr. Brandon and Mr. Granillo have both declared that they have never been there. Yet I found this Colosseum ticket in Mr. Granillo's waistcoat pocket. Which leaves me wondering, is it Mr. Granillo who frequents the Colosseum? Mr. Granillo, sir? Or is it Mr. Brandon who frequents the place? Mr. Brandon, sir. Hello, hello, Mr. Brandon. What's all this about Mr. Brandon? I was just asking the good Sabo Brandon whether Mr. Brandon would still travel to Oxford in all this rain. Wasn't I, Sabo? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I hope he told you that we are. What's a little rain, anyway? Now, have we any whiskey left? Oh, oh yes. I'll just take all this into the others. I'll be back in a minute. That's all right, Sabo. You can go straight away now, now that that's cleared. Thank you, sir. Back in a minute. That, Sabo, was what we call a white one. A white one, sir? Ah, sir, yes, sir. A white one, sir. Bonsoir, monsieur. Good night, Sabo. I wonder. I wonder. Hello? Sabo gone? Yes, Sabo gone. I want more cigarettes now. <laughs> Where are they? Brandon. Mm -hmm. I've just thought of something rather queer. Something queer? What's that? All this talk about rotting bones in chests. <laughs> talk about rotting bones in chests, Rupert? Yes. What about them? Do you remember when you were an infant, Brandon? Mm hmm. How you used to tell me stories around the fire? <laughs> yes, rather, I remember. Do you remember your chest complex, Brandon? My chest complex? Yes. Whatever the story was, piratical, detective, murder, adventure, or ghost, it always contained a marvellous denouement with a bloody chest containing corpses. You had a perfect mania for it, don't you remember? Yes. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> Why should you have remembered it? Yes, it's quite true. I remember now. <laughs> what about it, though? Oh, nothing. Just queer, that's all. How oh, queer, exactly? Well, just queer, us all talking tonight about rotting bones in chests. It just came back to me, that's all. <laughs> How's the old man getting on with his books? Going to take the entire library away with him, as far as I can see. I'm simply saying goodbye to it. Why don't you come in and watch him at it? Yes, I think I will. And I like that too. I say, what's the time? Uh, I want to be home fairly early tonight. Plenty of time. Come along. I'll just switch off the lights in here. Uh, now I've left the cigarettes I was told to fetch. Go along in, Rupert. I'll be in in a moment. Oh, very well. Oh, oh. Oh. to frighten you. Why do you want to sneak in like that? I wanted to see that everything was all right. Oh, I'm sorry. My nerve's going. I'll be all right. Oh. Pour, pour me another. Oh. Very well, then. But pull yourself together. I say, Grandma. Yes? You've got that little ticket, haven't you? You'd better give it to me and we'll destroy it right away. Now. Ticket? Ronald's ticket. Ronald's ticket. Oh, don't yeah. dither, Grandma. Ronald's mm. ticket. Ronald's Coliseum ticket. R Ronald's Coliseum ticket. Shh. Not so loud. Yes. I, I, I haven't got the Coliseum ticket. Oh, don't be a fool, Grano. I gave it to you. You, you didn't give it to me. Grano. Oh, wait. Wait, wait, wait. It's in my, it's in my waistcoat pocket. I, 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 
Yes, well, Rano. You, you, you didn't. You, you, here, 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 give it pocket. Uh, no, you, you didn't give it look to me. Look again. Look again. I never had it. I gave it to you into your hand. I didn't. I, I never gave had it, it into your hand. Since you got it, I gave it. I have got it. I tell you, where, where is it? It's in my waistcoat pocket. Oh, you put it in your waistcoat. You <laughs> put it in your waistcoat <laughs> pocket. Where is it now? Where is it now? My dear Brandon, what have you lost? <laughs> my. Temper, Rupert. Sorry, Grano. It's, it's, it's all right. Oh, I hope I'm not interfering. Uh, no, no, it's my fault. <sighs> you didn't know that Grano and I behaved like that, did you, Rupert? But we often have our little outbursts like this. Always about trifles, eh, Grano? Oh, yes. Oh. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm here on an errand. An errand? Yes, I want some rope. Rope? Rope? Yes, why so excited? Rope. The young people in the other room, having exhausted the lyric possibilities of the gramophone, are now projecting their entire youthful elan and ingenuity into the composition of a parcel, and they want something to do it up with. A parcel? Yes, the old man's books. Oh, of course. You'd better see what goes into it. I'm sure he's lifting all your best. Oh, hello. Here we are. I thought it was coming. Damnation. Surely you're not going to Oxford in all this. Oh, yes, we'll go. I'd clear up soon. <laughs> Besides, got nowhere to sleep here. Beds have all been dismantled. Well, that needn't worry you. can come round and put up with me if you care. I've plenty of room. Uh, no, thank you, old boy. I think we'll try and make it. Very well. Have it your own way. Oh. Hello, did you hear that? Mm, we heard it all right. We're scared out of our wits. I know, and it's simply coming down in sheets. Surely you're not going to Oxford tonight. Certainly we are. My dear, you can't. You'll be simply swamped out, my dear. Flooded, my dear. I hear you want some string. Uh, yes, say we do. Kenneth, hmm? where are the books? Oh, here we are. We're going to make a parcel, my dear. Come on. All right. Ah, we've got some paper. Now, where's the string? Oh, the string's in the other room. I'll get it. No, no, no. I'll get it. Where is it? It's in that sort of... Big vase thing, you know. Do you know the sort of big vase thing, Kenneth? Oh, yes, I know. I'll get it. Isn't he sweet? Yes, he is rather a lamb. Yes, a decided duck. Here we are. Uh, oh, and well Sir Johnston wants to know where he can browse on that sort of top shelf thing. I, I didn't quite Oh, follow. yes, I know what he means. I say, Grano, put that glass down and go in and explain to him. Oh, fine. Poor old man's getting into hopeless muddles. It's all right. Oh, <coughs> I'll go. I'll go. Just a little, I think. I should say completely. What? Grano Blotto. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he is a bit. Well, help me with this <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, my hat! I believe you're afraid of storms, Leela. My dear, I am. I simply rush round in circles. It's hereditary, you know. You should see my mother. What does she rush round in? My dear, she doesn't. She simply hides herself in cupboards. Really? They're all entangled in the linen, my dear. If it comes on again, you'll probably all see me suddenly take a violent plunge into this chest. <laughs> I should love to see that. Head foremost, <laughs> my dear. By the way, can you get into this chest, or is it locked? Oh, put your finger on this lock for me, Kenneth. That's it. Right. Can you get into this chest, Brandon? Or is it locked? What? Uh, oh, yes. You can get into it if you want to. Oh, well then, I'm safe. Isn't there a lock on it, though? Uh, yes. There is. Oh, my dear, you've forgotten. He's got his murdered man in here. Oh, so <laughs> he has. We'd forgotten that, haven't we? Well, you may have. I hadn't. Finger on the knot again, Kenneth, please. Like that? Yes. That's what he's been committing. Murder. <laughs> Finger tighter, please. And we've caught him red-handed. <laughs> oh, Leela, you don't know how near the mark you are. Oh, don't I? I know exactly what's inside this chest. What? There's an old, old man. You picked him up selling papers in the street and you did him to death for the gold fillings in his teeth. You've a lust for gold, my dear. <laughs> I see you've been following me. <laughs> it is locked, isn't it? But why a padlock? What have you got in it? But you know, Leela. You've already explained to us what is in it. I honestly think you ought to let us have a look. Have you got the key? Yes, I've got the key. It's in my waistcoat pocket. Well, hand it over and let's have a look inside. I'm hanged if I do. But why not, my dear? 
If you're really innocent, you can prove it, dear. But how often have I to tell you, Leela, that I am not innocent? My hands are red with a crime committed less than three hours ago. Oh, well, if you won't, you won't. All the same, if I had strong men about me, they'd force it from you. I'll be your strong man. Will you, Kenneth? <laughs> All right, go and be strong. How do I do that? Oh, that's up to you. All right, then. <clears throat> Now then, Mr. Brandon, hand it over or it'll be the worse for you. Said he, eyeing the other fearlessly. Come and get it, Kenneth. Um, which pocket is it in? Top. Right. Uh, my, my right or yours? Mine. Go on, seize it. I'll, I'll give him ten seconds, shall I? That's right. Right you are. Ten seconds. One. Two. Three. W w won't you surrender? No. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 My dears, what will men not do for me? <laughs> Slaughtering each other, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Oh, Raglan. Oh. We cannot on every occasion be strong, but it is always possible to be silent. What is he doing, dear? <laughs> I thought he'd bust my arm. I say, Brandon, you don't know your own strength, you know. You gave it an absolutely foul target. Kenneth, I'm profoundly sorry. Really? No, that's all right. That's what you used to do to me at school. So I'm not your strong man after all, Leela. Never mind. You come back to the mother heart. I think he's a beast. No, Leela. Only a desperate criminal, that's all. How fearfully interested in crime we all seem to be tonight. Why poor Brandon can't be allowed to commit his own murders in quiet, I don't know. Ah, it's a simple question of bringing assassins to justice. Oh, uh, how would you do that? Why, by having them arrested, of course. Oh, uh, would that do it? I've heard of assassins being brought to the Old Bailey, but I've seldom heard of them being brought to justice. I hope you're not confusing the two. I say, are you one of those people who don't approve of capital punishment? I think possibly I approve of murder too much to approve of capital punishment. Approve of murder? My dear Leela, there are so many people that I would so willingly murder, particularly the members of my own family and including the aunt so felicitously described by Mr Ragdon as living in Bayswater, <laughs> that it would be positively disingenuous to say that I don't approve of murder. Furthermore... I have already committed murder myself. How do you get that? It's all simply a question of scale. You, my friends, have paradoxically a horror of murder on a small scale, a veneration for it on a large. That is the difference between what we call murder and war. One gentleman murders another in a back alleyway in London for, let us say, since you have suggested it, the gold fillings in his teeth. And all society shrieks out for revenge upon the miscreant. And they call that murder. But when the entire youth and manhood of a whole nation rises up to slaughter the entire youth and manhood of another, not even for the gold fillings in each other's teeth, then society condones and applauds the outrage and calls it war. Hmm. How then can I say that I disapprove of murder, seeing that I have, in the last great war, acted on these assumptions myself? A lamentable thing, certainly, and responsible for the fact that tonight, instead of being able to fool around the gramophone with you two, a thing I should very much like to have done, I have to hobble about like an old man. But... The point is that I have proved that I don't disapprove of murder. Haven't I? No, you've done nothing of the sort. You'd be the first to be horrified by murder if it happened under your own nose. I wonder. Besides, you must have some moral standards. Must I? I can't recall any. Don't be absurd. You wouldn't hurt a fly. Wouldn't I? I've had thousands in my time. What are your own moral standards, then, Leela? Mine? 
time? Oh, Leela believes in the Ten Commandments, doesn't she? Oh, no, surely not. Why? What's wrong with the Ten Commandments? Nothing, whatever. Indeed, I have no doubt that they were of the profoundest significance to the nomadic needs of the tribe to whom they were delivered. Their inadequacy and irrelevance for today, though, must be sufficient to condemn them. I've often attempted to discover whether it is within the range of any of us to observe even one of them. Honour thy father and mother? Of course I do. How could I do otherwise? Indeed, on the occasion of my birthday, I have never failed to send them a telegram of congratulation. <laughs> Though whether this will make my days any longer in the land which has been given us must remain in doubt. But look at the others. Keep holy the Sabbath day. I don't. Take not the name of the Lord in vain. I do. Thou shalt do no murder. But I have done murder, as I have explained. And the seventh, Rupert? Committed. Since infancy. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. But property itself, as Proudhon has explained to us, is theft. And I am a man of property. Moreover, these are your matches. You, where did you... Indeed, the only clause I am sincerely capable of hearing to is the little stricture concerning my neighbour's ox and my neighbour's ass. <laughs> few and far between as are my neighbours who own oxes, and fewer and farther between as are my neighbours who own asses, I honestly think I could face either type in an emergency with a pure heart. <laughs> but then... It might be different if I lived in a rural district. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I still say that you'd never commit a murder. Your conscience wouldn't let you. Ah, but have I a conscience? He's quite right. And for one who hasn't a conscience, I can understand murder being an entirely engrossing adventure. You mean a motiveless murder? Yes. Yes, that really does happen sometimes, doesn't it? You do get people who murder purely sort of for the fun of the thing, don't you? Oh, what a peculiar idea of fun. No, but I've heard of cases like that. Certainly you have, and I for one can certainly enter into the excitement of it. The only trouble about that sort of thing is that you're bound to be found out. Why should you be found out? Because, my dear Brandon, that sort of murder would not be a motiveless murder at all. It would have quite a clear motive. Vanity. It would be a murder of vanity. And because of that, the criminal would be quite unable to keep from talking about it or showing it off in some fantastic way or another. The trouble with that sort of murderer is that he can't keep quiet about it. He won't hide it up. He wants to boast about it and say something, do something, and maybe something only just slightly outré, which gives him away. They have always done it, and they always will. Uh, but then, suppose you're murderer. You're really ideal, brilliantly clever and competent murderer. A genius at it, I mean. Suppose he was alive to the fact that vanity was the Achilles' heel to the thing, and went specially out of his way to see that he wouldn't get caught like that. I I'm talking of a genius at it. Oh, yes, but then he'd never be able to keep from talking about the very fact that he was so brilliantly clever, as you put it. So he'd give himself away just the same? Yes, but he might be so clever. Might, but wouldn't. Don't you think so? <gasps> Here we are. It's coming back again. Oh, yes, I'm getting sick of this storm. Yes, so am I. I say, you know, it's really about time I ought to be going. <laughs> yes. Same, same here, really. What an uncanny coincidence. Now you'll both be able to go together. I say, isn't it absolutely awful? Isn't it terrible? Are you really still going to Oxford, you two? Certainly. The storm's probably only just around London. Besides, it's not so bad now. It's not raining, as a matter of fact, now. If you're thinking of getting off. No, that's what I thought. Same here. Which is another curious coincidence. Oh, do shut up. Ah, excuse me. Hello? Uh, sorry, I can't hear. It's thundering, this end. What? Who? Who? The, oh, yes, yes, rather. Will you hold the line a minute? I'll get him. Uh, right you are. Just hold on. It's for Sir Johnston. Uh, Sir Johnston! 
You're wanted on the telephone, sir. The telephone for me? Yes, sir, they're holding on. It's in this room. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, here we are. Oh, excuse me, please. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, hello, yes? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, ah, that you, dear? Yes, yes. No, no, he's not here. Yes, yes, that's right. That's quite right, dear. Uh, uh, uh? Oh, no, no, no. He'll be back soon, I expect. He's probably held up in the... Uh, the uh, yes, dear. Uh, well, I'll be back there soon now. I'll be coming um, pretty well straight away. Uh -huh, uh? Yes, dear, yes. Right you are. Right you are. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, uh, Ronald hasn't come back. Hasn't come back? No. Oh, that's, that's, that's a storm. Yes, that's what it must be. Didn't you say he'd been to the Colosseum? Yes, that's right. Was he expected back then, sir? Yes, apparently he arranged to get back to tea. My wife gets so alarmed if there's any hitch. Well, he'll probably be back by the time you get home. Yes. Yes, I, I expect he will. Uh, well, I, I, I must be off. Um, where did I leave my hat and coat? I, um, oh, yes, out in the hall. Yes, oh. I'll go and get them. Sir Johnston, we've got your parcel all ready. Oh. Oh, that is sweet of you. Thank you very much. That's a wonderful parcel, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's not bad, is it? I should say not. Yes, that's, that's very convenient. There you are, sir. Oh, and oh yes, thank you. Not raining now. Uh, but I expect uh, you'd like a taxi, wouldn't you, uh, sir? Yes, I, I think I'd like a taxi. I'd rather like to get back. Uh, I, I can't. Think where that boy's got to. Your hat, sir. Uh, oh, thank you. I've uh, never known him fail when he said he'd be back. Then he must be very filial, sir. Yes, he is. Well, then it only remains to thank him for the most charming evening, to say nothing of the most charming company. The company being even more delightful than the books. <laughs> and that's saying an enormous amount. Well, good night, young lady. Good night. Uh, good night, young man. Good night, sir. Yes. And good night, Mr. Cadell. Good night, sir. And you know, uh, Brandon, I'll have to give you something in exchange for these books. But never, sir. Oh, yes, you must have something back. You must have some swaps, as we used to say. You must have your swaps. Oh, yes. Now you're forgetting them, sir. <laughs> what? Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, this won't do, will it? Just like me, just like me. I'm getting on, you know. Nonsense, sir. Yeah, I'm getting old. That's my trouble. Well, good night, Brandon. Uh, good night, uh, Grandilla. Good night, Sir Johnson. Here we are. Well, I'm, I'm going to. What part do you have to go to? Oh, I'm South Kensingtonish. Oh, th then we'll get a taxi, shall we? Uh, and I'll drop you. Oh, Where then do you live, Mr. Racklin? Me? Oh, I live up at Hampstead. Oh, I see. Then it'll be quite easy to drop her. Oh, well. <laughs> Come along in, Grano. I think we must go now. Oh. Well, won't you stay and have another spot? Oh, no, I don't think so. Uh, thanks awfully. I think I ought to be going. Yes. It's the same here. Re really. Well, if you're still going to Oxford tonight, I certainly wouldn't let him drive. What do you mean? I will not, Leela, you may be sure. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Grano. You certainly ought. <laughs> well, what, what, what do you mean? Well. Well. Oh. Are you coming? Uh, yes, Robert. I'm going too. Good night, yes, Grinilla. Good night, Rupert. Everyone got everything. Yes, yes. And do be careful. See you in the next pack. Thank you.
all's well. God, I, I, th I th thought he'd got onto it. Oh, Rupert? Yes. Yes, so did I for a few moments. But that's what gave a piquancy oh. to the evening. He hadn't. You, you're sure he hadn't? Quite sure. I sometimes rather wish he had. God, Rupert. Queer lad. I wonder. If he'd been with us, he wouldn't have got drunk, Grano. I'm not drunk. I'm a little, little blurred, that's all. Oh, no, what's that? What? I, th I thought I heard something. Oh, be yourself, Grano. Shh. I thought it was the bell. It, it was, it was. Well, what of it? I I'll go and see. Rupert. He's left his cigarette case behind, apparently. Have you seen it? No. Well, it must be here somewhere. Did you find it? Oh. Hello. I thought you might give me another spot. You're welcome, Rupert. Have a seat. Thank you. Um, cigarette? Uh, <laughs> I beg your pardon. I had my case in my pocket all the time. Oh, you ass. Just a splash, Rupert. Yes, yeah, a generous one. Ah, yeah. Thanks. Oh, dear heaven! What unmentionable fatigue! What? Living, living, living. I wonder if drink is a way out. Grano seems to agree with that. Yes, but he's not going to get any more. You're in a horrible state tonight, Granillo. You're positively silent drunk. Oh, I'm, I'm all right. I say, must we have all this light? What's wrong with the light? Nothing is wrong with the light, Granillo. Only I'm a creature of half-lights, and seeing that you have a pleasantly shaded little table lamp, can't we make use of it? Yes, I quite agree. But I hope you're not going to settle down too heavily and make yourself too much at home, because we've got to be off before long. Oh, that's better. Much better. I'm sad tonight, you know. And what's the time? Five and twenty to eleven. Five and twenty to eleven. Expect you're wanting to get rid of me, aren't you? Not at all, Rupert. I hope not. I'm full of melancholy and don't want to go home. You must bear with me. It's been such a... a strange evening. A strange evening? Why? Why it's strange? I can't tell you. That's my trouble. I suppose it's the thunder. One thing and another. Thunder always upsets me. Besides, I'm always melancholy at this hour. Five and twenty to eleven. It's a curious hour. Did you ever read Goldsmith's Night Piece? No. I can't say that I actually recall it. No, you should. It's about the city at night. I shall do his night piece up to date one of these days, and I shall make it five and twenty to eleven. Now. It's a wonderful hour. I am particularly susceptible to it. Why so wonderful? Because it is, I think, the hour when London asks why. When it wants to know what it's all about. When the tedium of activity and the folly of pleasure are equally transparent. It's the hour when jaded London theatre audiences are settling down in the darkness to the last act of plays of which they know the denouement only too well. They know that when a curtain's down, it'll be just a question of God save the king, and they'll be bundled out into a chilly, rainy night, where they'll have to fight for taxis, or, or rush for trains, or somehow transport themselves home to a cold supper and the prospect of another day tomorrow exactly similar to that which has passed. Oh. It's a horrible hour. I could enlarge upon the idea indefinitely. A macabre hour, for it is not only the hour of pleasure ended, 
It is the hour when pleasure itself has been found wanting. There. That is what this hour means to me, and it has, moreover, been thundery. Five and twenty to eleven. In brief, my dear Rupert, at this hour of the night, you see no earthly object in living. I fear not. Do you? I? Yes, of course I do. But then I'm interested in things. Why don't you get interested in things? Why don't you take up exploring, or cricket, or making love? or golf, or finance, or lecturing, or something. Or, as you suggested this evening, murder. Or, as you say, murder. Now, Rupert, we don't want to turn you oh, out. Oh, surely you're not going to do that. Surely you're not going to spoil my mood. No, we're not going to spoil any of your moods, but we've got to get going at some time. And we've got a bit of packing to do in one thing and another. No, you really mustn't spoil my mood. I shall write something tonight if I go on like this. My dear Rupert, a poetic frame of mind will hardly be induced by the spectacle of Grano and me filling suitcases. Oh, I certainly think it would. I'll tell you what. I'll stay and see you off. <laughs> I'm having another drink. That's enough of that, Grano. Mind your own business. Come along, Grano. Mind your own business. <sighs> well... It's not my business. Stay and see us off, Rupert. Doesn't look as though we'll get off with Grano in this state. I'm perfectly sober. Why does he want to stay and see us off? That's what I want to know. Why does he want to stay and see us off? My dear Grano, Rupert has no earthly reason in wanting to stay and see us off, and I don't know what you're talking about. There's no doing anything with you. I'm getting sick of this. Come along, Rupert. You'd better go and leave him with me. Well, I've got to go, then. What do you mean, Rupert? Got to go? Well, I think I thought for a moment that perhaps you wanted me to go as well. Oh, nothing of the sort. I was getting fed up with all this silly chatter and wanted to be alone with Grano, that's all. I don't want you to go. You don't? No. All right, then I'll stay. I said so. I said so. Grano! You're in a queer mood tonight too, Rupert. Oh, no, not a queer mood. An inspired mood, rather. One has inspirations, you know, extraordinary inspirations, and I have one tonight. Oh? What's that? Ah. Uh, I'll tell you that, perhaps. You haven't such a thing as a pin, Grinello, have you? A what? A pin. Y yes. yes it's, what, what do you want it for? I want it for my buttonhole. Uh -huh. Here you are. Rupert, what are you pinning in your buttonhole? A theatre ticket. <gasps> he's got it. He's got it. Hold your tongue. Right? Oh, yes, he's got it. Hold your tongue. He's got it. Hold your tongue. He's got it. Hold your tongue. Rupert. Yes? Rupert, this is nothing to do with you. Grano and I have a certain trouble between us which concerns no one else. Will you kindly oblige us by going at once and leaving us to it? Won't you tell me your trouble, Brandon? I might be able to help. No, I will not tell you our trouble. Please, go. It's nothing to do with you. No, Brandon, it may not be anything to do with me. But it may possibly be something to do with the public in general, and I'm the only representative in this room, won't you tell me? Are you going, or are you not? No, Brandon, I'm not going. <laughs> You see, I'm rather awkwardly situated. You're something more than that, my friend. Oh? How's that? You are very dangerously situated. Very dangerously situated indeed. Brandon, I have no protection. You have not. Save that of my foresight. Foresight? This whistle. A policeman gave it to me. I see. And when did he give you that? He gave it to me a few minutes ago before I came back for my cigarette case. He is now waiting for me to use it. He is waiting at the corner. It depends upon you whether I shall use it or not. What do you want from me, Rupert? I want two things. 
two truths. I want the truth about this ticket here and the truth about that chest, or rather its contents. Well, I can satisfy you on both. As for the ticket, it, I, I know nothing whatever about it. As for the chest, I simply do not know what you mean. You have succeeded in satisfying me on neither. Rupert, I have come to the conclusion that you are hopelessly drunk and that you'd better go home. It is possible that I am drunk, but not hopelessly, and I am not going home. <laughs> what is all this about? What is all this maudlin suspiciousness? This is not maudlin suspiciousness, Brandon. It is well-founded. From the first moment when I telephoned this house at a quarter to nine and heard over the wire your friend there crying for the dark, the suspicion was there. And that suspicion has been growing ever since. Growing ever since? Growing ever since? What do you mean? What do you suspect? I suspect murder, Brandon. The murder of Ronald Kentley. <laughs> oh, oh, my poor, poor Rupert. You don't know how you've relieved me. I imagined you'd got onto the real truth, which would have been devilish awkward. Murder. Oh, dear, that's good. Hear that, Grano. He suspects us of murder. Murder. Isn't that too rich? Is it possible that you are trying to bluff me? Bluff you? Bluff you? Get on out of here. Blow your whistle, blow your whistle, and bring the policeman in. Get on out. Do what you like. Ah, uh, since you say I can do what I like... May I see the inside of that chest? See the inside of that chest? See the inside of that chest? You can see the inside of 50,000 chests! Get on out! I did not ask to see the inside of 50,000 chests, Brandon, but to see the inside of this specific chest, and I cannot do that if I have to get on out. You're drunk. Possibly. Nevertheless, may I look inside that chest? Yes. Very well. I will. Go on, then. What are you waiting for? The key to the padlock, if you please. Oh, the key. It's upstairs, I think. Upstairs? Yes, yeah, should I go and get it? No, don't do that. I can force it. Must I? Must I do this? Here's your key. Now look and get what's coming to you. Thank you. You'll be sorry if you look in there, Goodell. You'll be sorry. I'll take the risk. Oh. You swine. You dirty swine. Now then, Rupert, sit down. I want to talk to you. Poor Ronald Kentley. What have he done to you? Sit down, Rupert. I, I want to talk sit to you. Sit down, Brandon. What do you mean? Sit down. For God's sake, sit down and listen. I want to explain. Explain? Oh, sit down. I'm at your mercy, I tell you. I'm at your mercy. Have mercy on me. I can explain. Have mercy on me. Sit down and judge me. Judge me. Well? Rupert, you're an enlightened man, aren't you? I profess to be, yes. And it is in your power to have me hanged. So it seems. And Granillo, too. And Granillo, too. Rupert. Yes? You remember our talk tonight about the Old Bailey and justice? Yes, well? And the difference between the two? You made the point. Yes. Yes. Well, remember that. You wouldn't be giving us up to justice. And now I want to ask you about something else you said. You do not rate life as a very precious thing, do you? No. Now listen, Rupert, listen. I have done this thing. I and Granilla, we have done it together. We have done it for adventure, for adventure and danger, for danger. 
You read Nietzsche, don't you, Rupert? Yes. And you know that he tells us to live dangerously. Yes. So we thought we would do so. That's all. We have done so. We have only done the thing. Others have talked. We have done. Do you understand? Go on. Listen, Rupert, listen. You're understanding. You're the one man to understand. Now, apart from all that, quite apart, even if you can't see how we look at it, you'll see that you can't give us up. Two lives can't recall one. It'd just be triple murder. You'd never allow that. And apart from that, too, our lives are in your hands. Your hands, man! I give them into your hands. You can't kill us. You can't kill. You're not a murderer, Rupert. What are you? We aren't. We aren't, I tell you. Don't tell me you're a slave to your period. You're an emancipated man. Rupert, you can't give us up. You know you can't. You can't, you can't. You can't. Can you? Yes, I know. There's every truth in what you've said. This is a very queer, dark, and incomprehensible universe, and I understand it little. I myself have always tried to apply pure logic to it, and the application of logic can lead us into strange passes. It has done so in this case. I shall never trust logic again. You've said that I hold life cheap. You're right, I do. Your own included. What do you mean? What do I mean? I mean that you have taken and killed by strangulation a very harmless and helpless fellow creature of 20 years. I mean that in that chest there now lie the staring and Futile remains of something that four hours ago lived and laughed and ran and found it good. Laughed as you could never laugh and ran as you could never run. I mean that for your cruel, scheming pleasure, you have committed a sin and a blasphemy against that very life which you now find yourselves so precious. And you've done more than this. You've not only killed him, you have rotted the lives of all those to whom he was dear. And in dragging his father round here tonight, you have played a lewd and infamous jest upon him, and a bad jest at that. And if you think, as your type of philosopher generally does, that all life is nothing but a bad jest, then you will now have the pleasure of seeing it played upon yourselves. What are you saying? What are you going to do? It's not what I'm going to do, Brandon. It is what society is going to do. And what will happen to you at the hands of society, I'm not in a position to tell you. But I can give you a pretty shrewd guess, I think. You're going to hang. Hang. Both of you. Hang. In Rope, by Patrick Hamilton, Alan Rickman played Rupert Cadell, and Adam Barham, Wyndon Brandon. Andrew Branch was Charles Grunello, and Christopher Good, Kenneth Raglan. Cyril Luckham played the part of Sir Johnston Kentley, and Moya Leslie, Leela Arden. Sabo was played by Olivier Pierre. The pianist was Mary Nash. The play was directed by John Tideman.